<laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. I'm Dr. Sandra Charles of the Library's Health Services and the Library's Physician, and I uh, welcome you to this joint program with Dr. Tomoko Steen from Science, Business, and Technology Division of our Library Services. And today's lecture is what we've been looking forward to. We s actually started the thought process uh, along these lines last Wednesday when we had our Family Health and Wellness Day and featured different alternative approaches to pain management and emphasized a lot about alternative medicine practices then. So this is very timely and it's in sync with our theme, which I think will continue for some time being that pain management and alternative medicine are such topical items. So we have with us today Dr. Hakeem Amri from Georgetown University, and um, she will be leading us along and guiding us and giving us all the various options as well as the latest in the light of alternative and complementary medicine. And you know, as a physician, we uh, generally, at least the, the traditional schools are trained in uh, traditional practices, but um, complementary and alternative medicine definitely uh, over the past, I'd say 10, 20 years, maybe even longer, have captured the imagination, and rightly so, of many uh, people who are having different ailments, and um, so much so that NIH has been conducting certain uh, research into different practices and certain ones such as acupuncture have become mainstream and actually covered by many of our insurance plans. So it is not a fly by night. Any of you who grew up outside of the city know that there have been many practices um, that were used when you had a cut or an ailment or a bump on the head. And um, myself having grown up in the islands, I always thought it was fascinating. If you had a really bad bump on your head, they would give you some super sweet sugar and water to drink. And at fr I really didn't understand it, but learning medicine, when you have head trauma to reduce, in increase intracranial pressure, you're given uh, glucose, 50% glucose solution to prevent the swelling. Somewhere along the line, there was that connection made. Now, whether or not the oral intake <laughs> is equivalent to the intravenous is a whole different story. But nonetheless, <laughs> it was going along those lines. And of course, there are many teas and, and, and salves and lotions that were used then. So it's always been a fascination and something that we're open to. And I think 21st century medicine is a combination of traditional and um, complementary and alternative medicine, hence the term integrative medicine. So I'm going to ask Dr. Steen to introduce our speaker, and then we'll sit back and um, get to learn something. So thank you so much for being here. It is wonderful to have the more audience today. And uh, but. Last Wednesday, I had 130 people stop by for the tea and the health you know, lecture and uh, discussion I had. We had many tables of the, um, you know, thinking about how to manage pain and uh, health in general. So, so um, I'm so delighted to have <laughs> my dear friend and uh, expert in the field, Professor Hakima Amari coming. And uh, she is a professor at the Department of Biochemistry and uh, Cellular Molecular Biology and the uh, Division of Integrative Physiology, that's the department she is in. And uh, she holds a master's and doctor's degree from um, on reproductive physiology and um, steroid biochemistry uh, from the Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris, France. And she is a co-founder of the CAM program at the Georgetown Medical School. And uh, she has been um, raising uh, experts uh, from 2003. So, you know, we have more uh, young people learning about this topic. And her approach is scientifically approaching, uh, you know, traditional medicine and how to assess them 
and that's a wonderful, you know, her b background is biochemistry, so this is a wonderful way of the doing it. And we have some books uh, from, um, you know, my division and uh, my colleague Ashley Kafia uh, picked up, and uh, that include a book just published by uh, uh, Professor Amari, and uh, so that is focusing on Greco-Arabic medicine, is it? Yeah, and uh, linking the 21st century biomedicine to Hippocrates and Avicenna. Maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> anyway, um, before further ado, please join me welcoming Professor Amari. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this very nice introduction from the leadership and from uh, my colleague, Dr. Steen. I'm very delighted to be here today and uh, sharing some of my work with you and speaking here at this very prestigious institution. So thank you very much. Uh, today's talk, I think you laid the ground for me. You are making my, my talk very easy now. <laughs> it's about integrative medicine. And we are going to uh, discuss a few points in addition to what has been said. Actually, I was going to say, I wish I were here for the tea party, <laughs> the real tea party <laughs> uh, from last week. Um, so today we are going to uh, talk about um, complementary and alternative medicine and integrative medicine, define that field of medicine, review the history of integrative medicine. We try to do that very briefly so we have more time for discussion. Uh, we are going to examine the role of integrative medicine in the management of chronic diseases. I think that's the focus of uh, uh, this month or this week uh, topics here at the Library of Congress. And then discuss its emerging role in uh, healthcare. We will try to save uh, time for questions and answers. Okay, so let's start by the first point here, which is defining uh, complementary and alternative medicine, uh, alternative medicine and integrative medicine. Here you are noticing already that it's a, a mouthful actually. So how are we going to define this uh, complementary alternative medicine and integrative medicine? So before, so, uh, before I go to my next slide, just to the raise of hand, how many of you have already heard of complementary and alternative medicine or integrative medicine. Very good. And um, if I ask you to tell me a little bit what it is, any volunteer who can tell me what that is? <laughs> yeah? Okay. I don't mean to put anybody on the spot, but uh, <laughs> just to be interactive. <laughs> okay, so uh, what it is really? The definition is very simple, and I always get that look on my students' uh, faces when I say, okay, the definition is simple, because they don't expect it. Complementary and alternative medicine as the therapies that are not usually taught in medical schools. That's all. <laughs> or not generally practiced or available in US hospitals. So that was the definition from back in the 90s. So that's, that's a question on the test for the students, actually. <laughs> so the definition is very literal to the, to the wording of it. It is, use, uh, it is um, complementary when it's used together uh, with conventional medicine. Makes sense, right? It's complementary when it's used in addition to antibiotics or to uh, painkillers. So that's complementary. And then it's uh, alternative, because it's, it's an alternative. It's used instead of the other medicine. So instead of taking a blood thinner, for example, the patient will start taking ginkgo biloba, for example, right? Which is known as a blood thinner. So that's alternative. We don't want that. <laughs> to happen. So, and it is integrative 
when it's uh, basically used together with um, when it's combined to a conventional medicine. But those therapies that are combined to call it integrative medicine have to be supported by science. So that's when it's integrated. So basically, as uh, it was mentioned before, acupuncture has been studied a lot for the past now 20 years, and science has shown that acupuncture works for pain, pain management. So now acupuncture is incorporated uh, in the medical treatment for pain, for example. It is reimbursed by many uh, health insurance companies, so that's a real integration. Acupuncture is supported by the evidence, by the science. Are we clear on that? If we are clear on that, we can proceed. <laughs> if you have questions, we can, I can go through that again. Okay, clear. Okay, so these are the basic definitions. And the latest consensus that uh, to define really this field came from the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Health, which is a center at the National Institutes of Health. And uh, I want you to keep in mind that that's the authority on all published, uh, on the science behind integrative medicine. So if you have a question about any aspect of integrative medicine, go to the NIH uh, website, and specifically the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. That's the authority. So their definition, quote, uh, the National Center of Complementary and Integrative Health generally uses the term complementary health approaches when we discuss practices and products of non-mainstream origin. We use integrative health when we talk about incorporating complementary approaches into mainstream health, and these complementary approaches are the ones that have been supported by science. Okay? So that's their definition. And... Um, that's what has been actually put out there, and that's what uh, the people fo should follow, the scientists, the, the educators, the private organizations, and all that. So they divide integrative medicine into different, into different categories or different domains, and there are five domains for integrative medicine. The biologically-based therapies or practices, and that's when you are using herbs. How many of you are using just supplements, herbs for health? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are the biologically based practices. Herbal products fall under that category. Mind-body medicine practices or mind-body medicine, how many of you are doing MBSR or yoga or, yeah, these practices fall under the mind-body medicine. Energy medicine, uh, that's where it gets a little bit murky. <laughs> now I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying that because energy medicine depends who you are talking to, but here we are talking about energy medicine like uh, biofeedback, tai chi, qigong, where they really, these practices call on the inner energy of the body to heal itself. Um, and then manipulati ma manipulative and body-based practices, and those are, how many of you go to see an osteopath or a chiropractor, massage therapist? Yes. So these are the uh, manipulative and body-based practices. Osteopathy, chiropractic care, massage therapy, where they basically manipulate the body. And then you see under that circle, the whole medical systems. That's the fifth category. The, uh, medic the whole medical systems are those medical systems that are used by 80% of the population on the planet. Um, and those are traditional Chinese medicine. It's a system. Ayurveda is a medical system. Uh, Yunani medicine or Greco-Arabic medicine is a medical system. So the people around the globe are using these other medical systems, and they are part of their health care. In China, for example, you walk into a hospital, and you have the conventional medicine, what we call, call by our definition conventional, which is conventional 
um, which is maybe unconventional in other countries. So you can, s you can uh, see the conventional physicians and the next door is the, um, the traditional practitioners in the same institution. So it's really integrated into the medical system, uh, sorry, into the medical healthcare system. It's the same thing in India. So in India, you have the conventional medical system, which is similar to ours here in the US. And also you have the Ayurvedic doctor and then the Unani doctor. So it's all hand in, uh, working together in parallel and in collaboration, of course. So these are the whole medical systems. These are the five categories of that medicine. And this is just another figure to show you what it is. So now we, uh, now we know, right? So it's uh, uh, practices like uh, yoga, massage, chiropractic, all those. Then there are other definitions by private organizations. So if I tell you today that one third of our medical schools, our health medical centers are part of a consortium that's called the Consortium of Academic Health Centers for Integrative Medicine. So we have what? We have about 150 medical schools. Over 70, about now 70 of those medical schools are part of that consortium. The consortium includes all the 17 medical schools in Canada and the medical school in Mexico, Guadalajara University Medical School, is part of that consortium. So, and they define, they took the lead on that and the consortium is really very active and um, you can check also their website. They have a lot of information there and they define integrative medicine as follows. It's the practice of medicine that reaffirms the importance of the relationship between practitioner and patient. Very important. Focuses on the whole person, is informed by evidence, and makes use of all appropriate therapeutic approaches, healthcare professionals and disciplines to achieve optimal health and healing. Optimal health and healing, very important. We will come back to that. So that's the definition by the consortium. Now, uh, any questions so far on that first section? Okay, at the end, okay. She is the boss, so <laughs> it's until the end. <laughs> A brief history of integrative medicine now. So what really feed or trigger a change, if I ask you? What really triggers a change, if you think about, yes. Uh, that's uh, uh, Herb Benson's book from, uni from Massachusetts University is uh, about meditation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the science. And then also the people who know about these things. So what triggers really a change, you need, uh, you need a, a grassroots movement, right? So in the 90s, people were ready to really take um, control of their health. So that's the grassroots movement. And then it takes also the science to prove that this medicine works or is used by the American population. And also it takes politics. Without the politics, we cannot do much. And without the money, we cannot do much. We know that. So part of the history that I'm going to share with you is basically these three elements that were happening in the 90s until now and really coalesce together to uh, create that, uh, that field, if you want, of integrative medicine. So the science. In the 90s, uh, there were surveys that were published from a group at Harvard University. And they showed that when they surveyed uh, the population, they showed that uh, more than a third of the, of the people surveyed uh, used one or more uh, complementary and alternative medicine therapies. So one third of the population was already using it. That uh, study also showed that um, 
the visits to the CAM providers exceeded the visits to the primary care physicians. Yes. And they estimated the out-of-pocket expenditures to exceed $27 billion. So that's the science. So the people were ready, and the science was showing it. So who are this uh, third of the population? It's uh, mainly the segment uh, between 50 and 70 years old. They are the most who have been using these practices. But you, you can see, I mean, it goes, uh, it's all different segments of the population. So here, yeah. And if you look at, that was published in the 90s, so uh, when you look at this segment of the population, it's basically the baby boomers who wanted to take charge <laughs> of their health. Okay. Um, then it continues to, sh this study is also showed that um, these people didn't necessarily reject conventional medicine, but they found it really congruent with their beliefs and with their philosophies uh, towards health and uh, life. The, the, one of the major points also that were shown in this paper is that 40% of, less than 40% of the camp therapies used were uh, disclosed to a physician. So the patients were going to their physicians and not telling them of what they were doing. And even today, I think many patients are not disclosing what they're doing with their primary care physicians. And that's where the danger, the danger la lies, lays, sorry. It's that if the patient is taking, um, as I mentioned before, blood thinners, and in addition, they are thinking that ginkgo biloba is good for them because it, it improves uh, memory and blood circulation, they are adding on top of the blood thinner another element that might, might cause problems. And that's why it's very important to know, or uh, very important that the patient disclose this information with their practitioners. But back then in the 90s, there was no training whatsoever of our physicians on these things. So even when the patient goes very well informed and uh, knowing about all these practices and all that, the, the doctor doesn't necessarily know what to say. So they start really mocking the patient and not answering the patients and ignoring the patients. And that created a big issue in the uh, patient, in the doctor-patient, you know, satisfaction um, outcomes. Okay, so that's just to show you in, uh, in uh, diagrams uh, who are those uh, who answered yes or no to uh, who who uh, reported to the practitioner to the practitioner or not their use of uh, these therapies and uh, how they heard about it. So you can see here that uh, the patients are the ones who talk about it most. They know they are very informed and. Um, very, it's only 20%, around 25% they hear about it from a practitioner. So as I said, our physicians are not trained in this field, at least until a few years ago. So that's the science. Now the politics. <laughs> you need the politics to make things happen. So in October of 1991, the US Congress passed uh, legislation that provided $2 million in funding uh, to establish an office at the National Institutes of Health to investigate and evaluate promising and conventional medical practices. So $2 million sounds a lot, right? No, for research and for do it's nothing, right? So they start, it start, at least it started somewhere, and uh, they created the Office of Alternative Medicine uh, back then, and they gave them this $2 million, 
when you think that the budget for the National Cancer Institute is in the trillions, so this is really nothing, right? So, and this was facilitated by Senator Harkin from uh, Iowa, who was instrumental. He was the chair of the appropriation committee back then, and he had a very good experience using bee pollen for his allergies. So he was like, okay, let's try it. Do you see when the politics meet the science? <laughs> um, so that's how it started. He took bee pollen and it worked for him. He has been suffering of allergies for many, many years. It's like, okay, let's study it. Let's, let, let's go to NIH and see if we can bring the evidence to that. So that's what happened at NIH. After uh, the Office of Alternative Medicine start, uh, was opened or launched in 1991, then a uh, few years later, it changed from an office to a center, which is already good progress. And <laughs> it was called the National Center for Complementary and Alternative for many years. And then they started acting as a center. They created a council, advisory council, and they started uh, giving grants out and uh, doing research and all that. And, um, and they, in 2007, their clinical center, you know that NIH has a, a hospital that runs protocols, and they see patients and all that. So they started this integrative medicine consult at the medical center and Dr. Berger is the one leading that. Um, so at NIH, they are giving some of these therapies. People don't know about that. NIH is giving some of those therapies inside NIH. And um, in 2015, the, the center changed name because the word alternative is not really a good fit for this medicine. We don't want anything alternative to our conventional med medicine. We want complementary, we want integration, but no alternatives. So the name changed to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health in 2015. Um, see, this is just uh, uh, to give you an idea about what's going on. So they do a lot of research at NIH in the, their intramural labs through their intramural funding, and they are studying pain, um, pain and natural products. Uh, the, there is a new director who just joined uh, this January of 2019. Uh, so she's an acupuncture researcher, and we are hoping that we'll see more research in that field. Um, so if you want authoritative information about integrative medicine, please visit the website of NIH. That's the website where to go to. Um, now, Outside of that, so now we have the politics, we have the grassroots movement, we have the science, things are happening. But what has been happening also in other, you know, organizations and other um, academic institutions. So for the past two decades, so we created the National Center of Complementary and Alternative Medicine. But also, I don't know if you, maybe you know that already, um, President Clinton called the commission, uh, it's called the White House Commission on Integrative Medicine, so he called the commission to really um, inform the politicians about integrative medicine. Um, it's called the White House Commission on CAM Policy. Uh, the consortium, as I mentioned before, was created, and also uh, another consortium on policy par in particular. Uh, so that was happening around 2000. There was another uh, other academic consortium for the allied health, uh, health uh, uh, colleges. And the VA started offering uh, chiropractic care to veterans way back then in 2004. Uh, of course, the uh, uh, Institute of Medicine also wrote a report on that, and uh, the conclusion was like, integrative medicine is here and it's going to stay, so you better get together and make it, <laughs> make it uh, you know, a practice the right. Uh, more also on that, so conferences, uh, research conferences started taking place. Uh, 
Um, and um, there was, as I mentioned before, uh, the NIH uh, clinic that opened around that time. Uh, the other organizations uh, also uh, started, like the WIN, which is the Wellness Initiative. Uh, this was also a national movement. Um, the, the second IOM report, the second report from the Institute of Medicine, and a lot of things happening um, at this, you know, throughout these years, all the way to 2019, where, as I said, the new director for um, NCCIH. Okay? The VA has always been ahead, it seems. So early in 2004, they started offering benefits for uh, chiropractic care, and now uh, they are um, leading the way by creating this uh, health and wellness at the VA. They are offering more now, uh, acupuncture, they have battlefield, they developed actually a protocol called the battlefield acupuncture uh, that's offered on the battlefield uh, to manage pain and, yeah, so they are really ahead of, of, of the game. And they are really working on this model where, uh, on this model where the patient is at the, as, at the center. That's me, the patient. And then it's uh, the patient should take care of his or her health, uh, take care that, you know, really be in charge of their health. Um, so self-care, then professional care, they think that the community, the, the workplace should be also favorable to develop, the, you know, to have this wellness. And of course the community, it's very important to have family support and community support for better health. So they are trying to develop this uh, model, which I think the way I teach it to my students, it's called the biopsychosocial model <laughs> of health. And I, I mean, I have been following this movement now for the past 20 years, being, you know, really in the middle of it. We are moving from the biological model to um, the biopsychosocial model, which is more comprehensive. And the VA is following that. So the other, co the other player in this uh, are the hospitals. And um, there was a survey that was sent to uh, many hospitals around uh, 2000, um, um, 2010, and they were asking if uh, they have any integrative medicine uh, practice in the hospital. So um, in 1998, only 8% of our hospitals were offering one or more of these CAM modalities. Uh, then this number started increasing, and in 2011, 42% um, of the hospitals around the country are offering one or more of these modalities. And I'm sure by now, which is almost 10 years later, this number is even uh, higher, I'm assuming that, uh, because I see the change. Um, unfor unfortunately, there haven't been any new surveys for the past 10 years. So that's what's happening, and the key reasons, the key reasons is the grassroots movement. Patients are asking for it. Patients are demanding to have choices, to have a multidisciplinary approach to their, to their health. And then um, the other reason is that there is clinical effectiveness, people who are practicing it or doing, you know, adding these other modalities to their health or their health programs are seeing an effect. It's effective. And of course, there is always the economic component. Uh, um, hospitals are doing it to attract more patients. Okay. Integrative medicine and the management of pain. Chronic diseases is a big issue in this country. Um, six in 10 adults in the US have a chronic disease, and four in 10 adults in the US have two or more of them. And this has been really an issue for 
our country. And that runs from heart disease to cancer to chronic lung disease to stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease, and I would add to that list obesity. Obesity is also a big issue in our country. Um, so here, this graph shows the years lived with disability, that's in 2013 in the United States by cause and age. These are the age segments, and here it's the percentage of years lived in less than ideal health. So people who are living with moving around, doing some kind, all kinds of, illness, of, of illnesses. So you can see here the green is chronic respiratory disease, the red is diabetes, urogenital blood and endocrine problems, the yellow is the mental and substance abuse, dis abuse disorders, and the blue is the musculoskeletal disorder, the pain basically, the lower back pain, the shoulder pain, the osteo osteoarthritic pain, so these are the musculoskeletal diseases. And here you see that the mental health at early in age is prevalent, but then it switches to these pain problems. Okay, so the chronic diseases are, um, are going to increase until 2030. This is the estimate until 2030. And in parallel, our spending, of course, on healthcare is going to increase because these are debilitating issues and healthcare needs to spend on that. Um, so the healthcare spending here also increasing, um, and it's going to reach the our, I think they're going to meet somewhere, our GDP. <laughs> <coughs> the surveys, I mentioned the survey from the Harvard University, but the CDC also conducted two surveys which were bigger than the study from Harvard. They, started, they uh, conducted um, a survey in 2002 and a survey in 2007. The difference between the two is that in 2007 they included children and uh, integrative medicine used by the parents you know, on their children. And what you, why I want to share this with you is that pain is the major condition that was reported by this uh, Paul people. So back pain, uh, neck pain, joint pain, arthritis, these are all pain, pro, uh, disability, uh, uh, yeah, pain and disability, okay. Pain and debilitating diseases. The, dis the survey in 2007 independently showed the same trend. Back pain, neck pain, joint pain, arthritis, the f major four issues. What is used? They use natural products, deep breathing, yoga, tai chi, qigong, chiropractic or osteopathic manipulation, meditation, massage, all these other modalities. That's what the survey showed. Now, Let's, do we have any idea what's the share of this um, integrative medicine in our healthcare um, spending? So this is back in 2012. Our spending for 2018 was 3.65 trillion. So back in 2012 when this was done, it was 2.82 trillion. This is the share of the pie for integrative medicine. Very small, but it's still in, bil in millions. And the blue, uh, the blue part here is the conventional out-of-pocket uh, expenditure. So people are willing to pay out-of-pocket to feel better. That's what it is. So if we, uh, if we increase that part here, then um, you see where it goes to uh, com complementary practitioner visits, 14.7 billion, self-care purchases, 2.7 billion, non-vitamins, non-mineral, natural products, 12.8 million. 
So that's the share of the market. So there is also this global movement of wellness which has also a big share of the economy here in the United States and around the world, actually. So the global wellness economy is 4.2 trillion market. And the industry is growing really fast. Uh, in, the pa in three years from, seven from 2012 to um, 17, uh, sorry, 2015, just in two years, it grew 12, over 12%, right? So, um, there is all this also happening in our country. This is just to show you what are these key uh, sectors. And I'm going to focus on healthy eating, nutrition, weight loss. There is a lot happening there for our wellness. People are willing to spend out of pocket to feel good. That's the message. So what are the key points so far? Let's recapitulate. What have we learned so far? <laughs> that integrative medicine is used by the American people and not always disclosed to the physicians. That co government agencies are incorporating integrative medicine in their healthcare program, and we see that at NIH and at the VA, right? The third point is that private organizations and academic health centers are promoting and teaching integrative medicine. As I said, 70 of the 150 medical schools here in Canada and Mexico are uh, teaching some kind of integrative medicine. So we are trying our best. And Georgetown is part of that consortium. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> um, we have the highest expenditure on healthcare in the world. And yet, we are, oh yeah, we are the sickest nation. <laughs> um, so yet, pain and the use of painkillers are not adequately, adequately ma managed, we know that. The opioid epidemic is ravaging and we need to do something about it. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit now to talk about the management and the best practices. This is a report that just came, back, came out of the HHS. Um, and it's, uh, it was called, of course, from the leadership there, from uh, the HHS. They put together uh, an inter, um, interagencies uh, commission to look into how to manage pain and how to put there the best guidelines for it. So NIH was part of it, the FDA, uh, um, of course the HHS, ARC, all these organizations were part of that um, commission. And the recommendations came out a few weeks ago, a few months ago. What does it say? So they have this long report, and of course, what are the alternatives of the, to the opioids? So you can read the report if you are interested, to, uh, interested in that. So they had in section 2.5, the behavioral health approaches. And that's, these are some, they kind of intersect a little bit with integrative medicine. Because it's behavioral therapy, they, instead of giving the magic bullet to stop the pain, maybe, direct people or the patients to do some behavioral therapy. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, biofeedback, relaxation training, so looking into other alternatives rather than the magic bullet, okay? Now, section 2.6, they have a section 2.6 on complementary and alternative medicine and integrative medicine, and they list acupuncture, massage and manipulative therapies, mind-body stress reduction, yoga, tai chi, so they're listing some of those modalities, which is great, right? So it's under the, it's under the radar for the HHS. The way it was uh, written, though, is like, yeah, they are there, they exist, but more research is needed. More proof that they work is needed. So basically, that's how it has been for the past 20 years. 
we need more research, we need more research. Although there are so many studies that have been showing that m these modalities are working. Okay, now um, what is the evidence? We talked about acupuncture. Acupuncture has been shown in many, many studies that it's, that is efficient in reducing post-surgical uh, pain when they compare it to sham acupuncture, when they compare it to other controls, and it's also uh, effective in reducing the side effects of opioids, reducing the intake of opioids and the side effects from op opioids. So this has been studied and, and shown. That, uh, that acupuncture is effective in acute pain, even in the emergency department. When people go with the shooting pains you know, to the extremities, and uh, they have been managed with the acupuncture in the emergency department. Um, acupuncture has been shown to be superior to sham and control for chronic pain like osteoarthritis of the knee, uh, neck pain, shoulder pain, uh, non-specific back pain, low, ba lower, low back pain. And these are the studies, if you are interested in that, you can go and check the, the, the literature. So the evidence is there. We know that there is evidence. Is it getting to the right policy makers? And <laughs> uh, we don't know. So we are trying our best to really um, make these studies known out there. So this is, I mentioned the consortium at the beginning and the consortium is very active. So there is already a response to that draft from the consortium. And the response is that there is the science behind it. There, is, there are studies, there are um, systematic reviews, there are clinical trials that have been showing the effectiveness of acupuncture. So I'm focusing here on acupuncture because it's the most studied, but there are also studies on biofeedback for headache pain, uh, biofeedback for anxiety, um, so there are other studies for other modalities as well. Yoga is very good. There is a whole field of science of yoga out there. Actually, we offer a course for our students on the science of yoga where they go and look at the literature and it's taught, like it's taught by a PhD, actually, the science of yoga, who is a yogi herself. So there is a lot out there. Um, the, other, uh, the other obstacle, I think, to really talking freely or incorporating 100% integrative medicine is the are the insurance companies. The insurance companies are following the guidelines that come from the government, right, from the HHS and all that. So if the HHS is reluctant, of course the insurance companies are not necessarily going to go on their own and start covering all these modalities. Acupuncture is the most covered uh, by many, company, uh, my, uh, many insurance companies. Some massage therapists, some companies ma uh, cover that if it's specified, coded for the right, uh, the right, you know, um, uh, patient and the right code and their pain, muscular pain or something like that, then it's covered by some, in some uh, insurance. So here, so what if acupuncture were covered by insurance for pain management? This is a cross-sectional study for cancer patients. Um, it's a big study. And the conclusion was that one in two cancer patients uh, was willing to use insurance covered acupuncture for pain. So again, the grassroots, people are willing to use it if it's covered, if it's available, if, you know, the politics follow. <laughs> um, there is another study which analyzed also the state of insurance coverage for non-pharmacologic treatment for, of low back pain as recommended by the American College of Physicians guidelines. So when all this opioid epidemic kind of, you know, came to light and all that, many of these organizations became very active and wanted to really uh, help on managing this crisis. So the American College of Physicians came out with, men, with a number of guidelines on how to, to do it but nothing was taken into consideration. Now it has been a few years and nothing has been happening. So um, what's, what 
what are their conclusions is that essential health benefits are routinely excluding non-pharmacological therapies. So they still believe that the magic bullet works better. We don't necessarily send the patients to anxiety management or to behavioral therapy or we don't do that. Uh, insurance coverage discourages multidisciplinary therapies for chronic pain. And of course they make their guidelines so ambiguous that, no, that nobody can read <laughs> or understand what they cover and what they don't cover. And they have uh, many restrictions on ongoing th complementary therapies. This is, um, what we need is really to have enlightened EHB coverage to really help alleviate this opioid crisis. So we need to be very active and bring our two cents to the table each time whenever we have the, the occasion to do it. What is, what is the take home message? Integrative medicine considers the body as a whole unit and not as independent parts. So it's true we are the most sophisticated machine. We, have the, we are, the body is the most incredible machine one can design. Um, and the way we have been really looking at that body is in parts. If, if you have chest pain, you go to a cardiologist. If you have knee pain, you go to a rheumatologist. If you have, I don't know, diabetes, you go to an endocrinologist. So we kind of divided the body into different, these different parts. But in fact, the heart could be affected by the mind. <laughs> it's that easy. We need to treat the mind so, that the, so the heart can feel better. So we need to think of, um, of the body as a unit. And that's what I mentioned earlier, the biopsychosocial model where all the components should work together. I designed, I designed this model a couple of years ago. It's a, I adapted it from uh, the HHS services. And so the patient should be at the center. It doesn't matter, I think. It does, that's my opinion. It doesn't matter which therapy you are going to get or who is which practitioner, as long as these doctors are, co are putting you at the center. You are the center of focus and the main goal is to make you feel better. You are at the center of this model. And then you have the MD, you have the osteopath, you have the chiropractor, you have the naturopath helping what we need to do with our healthcare system is move from this very siloed medicine to a comprehensive integrated medicine where the patient is at the center and then all the physicians and the practitioners and the allied health uh, providers are working together to make you, the patient, us, the patients, to make us feel better, and we are the center of their focus. That's what we want, and uh, maybe we'll get there one day. <laughs> In conclusion, integrative medicine offers a multidisciplinary patient-centered approach to treatment by focusing on the mind and the body together. Uh, it promotes complementary med modalities in addition to pharmacological. So Integrative medicine, what I want you to really keep in mind is not to reject our conventional medicine, is to integrate it to our conventional medicine. And please um, don't think that if it's natural, it's, it's safe. That's the biggest mistake. Natural doesn't mean safe. As I mentioned, ginkgo biloba, which is natural, is not necessarily safe if you are taking other drugs because the drug herb interaction could be really detrimental. So these are the, the, mes these are the two messages today, <laughs> take home messages. So the other thing is integrative medicine treatments have been shown to be cost effective and there are a few studies on 
the cost effectiveness of these therapies with insurance, co with the insurance uh, coverage, and they are way cheaper. Uh, we need to teach integrative medicine in medical schools. I think we got to a point where we want to go to an informed physician who can make informed decision about the referrals, where to send you. If you have back pain um, and you go to a physician, maybe surgery is not the first option, right? Maybe you need to ask your physician, okay, let's do some imaging to remove all kind you know, of other issues, but if it's musculoskeletal or, or or as as it is the most i mean as it is the case in many patients let's maybe go to other explore other options before we go to surgery so you need to see a, an informed uh, physician and this cannot happen unless we teach these modalities in our medical schools um, so if we do all that it could contribute to providing a better quality of care that's what we want uh, before I end here, I want to um, make you aware that we have a program at Georgetown University that uh, I launched um, 15 years ago already uh, in, on integrative medicine. So my goal is to train a new generation of physicians with, who look at healthcare and the patients with different eyes. So that's the goal of that, uh, of that program and it's really to educate open-minded healthcare providers and scientists who are eager to explore the state of the evidence in areas of complementary and integrative medicine with objectivity and rigor. Um, as, as a scientist, I'm always, you know, after objectivity and rigor. So that's what we need. We need the science to support this integrative medicine. And uh, this is the quiz. I you are, don't think you are going to uh, leave without the quiz, <laughs> taking the quiz. Okay, so let's see. What is this one? Echinacea, and it's used for? Yeah, for cold, yeah. Uh, mild colds, right? Don't wait until f uh, for it to happen and then start taking echinacea, start taking echinacea. Next one, that's an easy one. That's ginkgo biloba, yeah. It's used for uh, memory and because it works for blood, it improves blood circulation. Then uh, this one, very easy, yeah. Good for digestion, right? Uh, oh yeah, we cannot miss that one. Cholesterol reduction, blood pressure, very good. This one. Uh, it looks like chamomile, no. No, it's not. It's yellow like, it's yellow like chamomile. Okay, let's go to the next one. We'll come back. Ginger. Digestion also. Digestion also. Uh, some here, some uh, wellness products. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Turmeric. Cumin. Yeah, absolute star, anise. Yes, star anise, and uh, this is cardamom, I think, too. Okay, so these are some spices and herbs. The picture is too small, I think, to see that. So let's go back to this one. This is St. John's wort. Yeah, and it's used for mild, not all depression, used only for mild depression. That's what the studies have shown. It cannot be used for severe depression, okay? St. John's wort. St. John's wort, like St. John, the St. John. It's called St. John's wort because it really uh, blew, it flowers, it blooms on the St. John day in June. <laughs> I think that's why, that's the reason. <laughs> I think around the 20th of June, it's called St. John's wort. Um, okay, this one here is ginseng, and you see a lot of drinks and tea, you know, using ginseng. But what they don't tell you is that ginseng is only effective it's if it's really old. If it's a young ginseng, it has no effect. So just be careful. When you go buy ginseng, ask for how, how old is the root. <laughs> for this one, for example, which is a 300-year-old, it was sold for $400,000. Wow. 
So you can see it's very expensive. And all this tea that you see around, I don't think it's from that batch. <laughs> OK, with this, I thank you. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Questions? Yes, madam. No, I think um, it's very important for everybody, you know, when you are a child and you go to school or nursery mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. to see whether the child is walking correctly oh. and uh, everything. And then also, my suggestion is to make the habit of exercise in school. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Exercise. The leadership is here. Ask them. <laughs> you have it. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Absolutely. It's very important because uh, you. I mentioned. The question is to encourage uh, exercise and movement as part of health, and it should be part of health. Absolutely. So there are there are two fields of medicine that deal with that: osteopathic medicine and chiropractic medicine. And they are both really focused on the alignment of the spine and uh, alignment of the st spine with the brain, basically, with the head. And they think that this alignment is very important in maintaining health. So it is. And uh, we should all promote it, absolutely. Um, I don't know if you know the difference between chiropractic and osteopathic. There are two different fields of medicine. Although osteopathic uh, schools now, they don't want to consider themselves uh, into, uh, alternatives. They are really uh, they are, um, operating as conventional medical schools. So chiropractic uh, really focuses on the alignment of the spine uh, with the head, you know. And uh, osteopathic medicine, they tend to expand a little bit to the musculature. So it's the musculoskeletal alignment. The, they are very uh, close. They were also um, uh, founded around the same time here in the United States. So these are two fields of medicine that, are, that, found their, that have their origin here in the US. And we don't know about, I mean, we don't, when we talk about it, it's like always coming from a different planet. No, chiropractic and osteopathic were founded here in the U United States, as well as naturopathic medicine, founded here in the United States. And um, um, I'm glad you mentioned the islands before. Um, there is also a use of integrative medicine and these practices among the Native Americans and the Alaskans, so they still use their traditional approach to, uh, to health. Okay, mm -hmm. other questions? Yes, madam. Uh huh. Uh huh. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah, absolutely. You heard. You all heard the question. Okay. The the oh for the camera. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, what is the regulation of herbal products? How do we know about the the quality of the herbal, the quality and safety and efficacy of the herbal products? Very good question. In the United States. The herbal products are not, are not regulated as drugs. So if they are not drugs, they are regulated as foods. So if they are not drugs, then they don't really fall under the same scrutiny as a pharmaceutical drug. And that's what's creating all this confusion, who is controlling the safety and the efficacy and all that. So. The drugs, this is different than other countries. For example, in Germany, um, in Germany they have, they have a book called the Commission E, the German Commission E, 
And there, it's basically a repertoire of all the plants that they use and all the amount, the content, the, you know, the scientific name, everything, how it should be taken, the dosage and all that. So that's called the German Commission E. Um, in Japan, it's regulated as Kempo. Yeah, it's very well regulated. Here in the United States, it's a little bit different. So it's regulated as food. And um, there is a regulation that went through uh, uh, the regulatory bodies called the Doshia. I don't know if you are interested in reading about that, um, where they try to regulate it. So the pharmaceutical companies didn't want Want, the drug, uh, want herbs to be regulated as pharmaceutical drugs, which is maybe not a bad idea, but there isn't really, there isn't much money in it. The pharmaceutical drugs are surviving because, I mean surviving, they're making a lot of money, uh, because any compound that they create, they patent it and they make a lot of money out of that patent. But, but uh, herbal products, you cannot patent it, it's part of nature. Right? <laughs> so that's why there is no interest really, in, there is no money in doing these big clinical trials, multi-center clinical trials with uh, herbal products. The standardization is getting there. For example, if you go to buy um, ginkgo biloba again, I will stay with that example, it should be standardized to an active element in the, the mixture. Ginkgo biloba, I think it's standardized to 24% of ginkgo lights. So ginkgo lights are chemicals inside and every batch has to have at least 24% of that. And I think 2% of biloba lights or something, or terpenes and so it, every drug, uh, sorry, every herbal product has to be standardized to a certain chemical inside. And that's when you know the quality. So when you go to buy, um, your product, you have to, you need to read the small print standardized to so and so percentage of the active ingredient. So where do you get the standards? The standards are put by the science, yeah. Uh, I mean, the standards are by the manufacturers, and it's uh, the manufacturer is standardizing to that. So you, what you need to do is to go to the NIH website and say, okay, the standard for ginkgo is 24% of this, and for, um, um, for um, echinacea, it's the hypericin. So you need to look, at for, look for this active ingredient if it contains the, the right percentage and all that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the contents were at will values, mm -hmm. or on the result of a count of herbal value. But in some cases, none of the, none of what was on the absolutely was on the bottle. And without a national health plan, mm -hmm. it will be truly regulated. Absolutely. The consumer is the you know, is left the mercy the, mm -hmm. of people who are looking for profit. That's what you <laughs> Uh, uh, I agree with that. There were even worse cases than just, you know, misleading the labeling. There were cases of adulteration of the products. Uh, I don't know if you want to read about that. Uh, it's called the SP SPES, SP, SPES, the P, sorry, the PC SPES, which was a, a, a compounded, a, a compounded uh, mixture that was funded by the NIH to do clinical trials for prostate. And they found that it was adulterated by pharmacological drugs. So there is, out, out there, there is a lot to you know, sift through, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Every good thing comes to an end. <laughs> <laughs> and we thank you very much. You're absolutely a good thing. Thank you. And I think